thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator DeMint, who uh, believed in me when really the only people, most of the people that believed in me lived in my house. <laughs> and thank you to CPAC. I'm really honored that you have me here today in Washington. You know, a week ago, we didn't know we were going to make it here. We were watching this, all the images of that winter weather, this extraordinary blizzard that even impacted government. I don't know if you know this, but the Congress couldn't meet to vote on bills. Yeah. The regulatory agencies couldn't meet to set new regulations either. And the president couldn't find anywhere to set up a teleprompter to announce new taxes. You know, now that I come to think of it, the blizzard may be the best thing to happen to the American economy in 12 months. I also want to take a moment and recognize all of you folks that came up from Florida that are here today. I know I saw some of the young Republicans from the University of Central Florida here, and I wanted to recognize them. Thank you. And finally, my wife was able to join us here today. See, I told you people really come to my speeches. <laughs> you know, as I reflect on this campaign, not to mention all the opportunities that I've had in my life, it often reminds me of my grandfather. My grandfather was an enormous influence on me growing up. He was born in 1899 to a poor rural family in Cuba. When he was a very young man, he had polio, and it permanently disabled him. So he couldn't work the farm, and so they sent him away to school. In fact, he became the only member of his family that can read. And he would read anything and everything he could. Now, when I was growing up, my grandfather lived with us. And on many days, I would sit on the porch of our home and listen to him tell me stories about history, about politics, and about baseball as he puffed one of his three daily cigars. Now, it's been over 27 years since I sat on that porch. And so all the details of the things he told me are not as clear as they once were. But there's one thing I vividly remember. It was a powerful sentiment that he wanted to make sure I understood. And that was because, and that was this, that because of where he was born and who he was born to, there was only so much he was able to accomplish. But he wanted me to know that I would not have those limits, that there was no dreams, no ambitions, no aspirations unavailable to me. And he was right. See, I was not born to a wealthy or connected family, and yet I have never felt limited by the circumstances of my birth. I have never once felt that there was something I couldn't do because of who my parents were or weren't. Now, why is it that I've been able to accomplish the things that my grandfather could not? Why did my dreams have the chance that his didn't? And the answer is simple, because I am privileged. I am privileged to be a citizen of the single greatest society in all of human history. There's never been a nation like the United States, ever. It begins with the principles of our founding documents. Principles that recognize that our rights come from God, not from our government. <laughs> Principles that recognize that because all of us are equal in the eyes of our Creator, all life is sacred at every stage of life. <laughs> now, these principles embody a commitment to individual liberty, which has made us the freest people in history. They also made possible our free enterprise economy, which have made us the most prosperous people in history. The result is in America, which is the only place in the world where it doesn't matter who your parents were or where you came from. You can be anything you are willing to work hard to be. The result is the only economy in the world where poor people with a better idea and a strong work ethic can compete and succeed against rich people in the marketplace and competition. And the result is the most reliable defender of freedom in the history of the world. Simply put, there's nothing like America in all the world. And even today with the problems that we face, who would you rather be? Which country would you trade places with? Just remember and ask yourself, 
When was the last time that you heard news accounts about a boatload of American refugees arriving on the shores of another country? <laughs> And yet there have always been those that haven't seen it this way. There have always been those that don't recognize this. They think that we need a guardian class in American government to protect us from ourselves. They think that the free enterprise system is unfair, that a few people make a lot of money and the rest of us get left behind. They believe that the only way business can make its money is by exploiting its workers and its customers. And they think that America's enemies exist because of something America did to earn their enmity. Now the problem is that in 2008, leaders with this worldview won elections. And now, they know that the American people will never support their vision of America. So instead, over the last 12 months, they have used a severe economic downturn, a severe recession, as an excuse to implement the status policies that they have longed long for all this time. In essence, they are using this downturn as cover, not to fix America, but to try to change America. To fundamentally, to fundamentally redefine the role of government in our lives and the role of America in the world. And let's remember this, the expansion of government at home has implications abroad for our country. You know, this growth in our government is being funded by borrowed money. And almost half this money is held in foreign countries. In fact, one of them, China, every time we say something they don't agree with, they remind us of that. The good news is that it didn't take long for the American people to figure all this out. And now as we near these midterm elections, what the American people are looking for is very clear. They are looking for leaders that understand what has happened, will come up here and stand up against it, and in its place will offer a clear alternative. First, we have to understand what's happening. Leaders at the highest levels of our government are undertaking a deliberate and systematic effort to redefine our government, our economy, and our country. Now, people, as I said, all across America figured this out over a year ago. They didn't wait for their senator or for their congressman to do something about it. They did it themselves. They have taken matters into their own hands, from tea parties to the election in Massachusetts. From tea parties to the election in Massachusetts, we are witnessing the single greatest political pushback in American history. The political class tries to make sense of all this, but they can't. Because never has the political class or the mainstream media that covers them been more out of touch with the American people than they are today. You see, 2010 is not just a choice between Republicans and Democrats. It's not just a choice between liberals and conservatives. 2010 is a referendum on the very identity of our nation. Yes. And the issues are so big, so consequential, so generational, that many of the old rules of political engagement will not apply. For example, a long list of early establishment endorsements will not spare you a primary. Yeah. 